Well, praise the Lord. Are we glad to be in God's house this morning? I am. I woke up, I had a, an awful, stupid dream. For real. I don't know what makes you think of certain things. Dreams, a lot of times, are your brain's way of dumping out the garbage. And there's no telling what's going through my head, but I dreamed that I was in college, but not Bible college. I dreamed I was enrolled in a public university, and it's like everything I was afraid of or I, or I don't like about public universities, like their extreme liberalism and every other godless thing that goes on at campus was going on. And I'm going, I don't like this. I don't like this. And I'm thinking, so why am I enrolled in college? I had no idea. So you wake up and then you're going, where in the world did that come from? But, so I'm glad to be in God's house this morning. Amen. Second Corinthians 12, verse 8. We, uh, I think we've covered a lot of issues concerning thorns. And I want to move on from that um, and talk about the opposite of thorns. In this case, the opposite of those thorns is how God answered Paul's prayer. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. For this thing, meaning his thorns, and, a, and the messenger of Satan, which was a, it was a devil, it was a, an an evil angel. Uh, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Three times. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So then Paul responds, Most gladly, therefore, Will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. Let's count those. Infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses. Five things. The fifth time... Noah's name is mentioned. And this goes back, if you study Genesis 5, you know that there's a lineage given. And each person in the lineage in Genesis 5 is mentioned five times. Now, I don't see an accident here. I, I see a purpose. And the fifth time they're all mentioned, they die. Because it says, when it mentions Adam... The generations of Adam and so on. Adam lived so on and so many years. And then the last thing it says, and Adam lived 930 years and he died. And then after that, it talks about Enos, or excuse me, Seth, his son. Seth mentioned five times and it says Seth lived so on and so on years and he died. And then Enos, Enos lived so on years and he died. And it, it repeats that pattern. Uh, Enoch breaks that pattern. Enoch doesn't die, fifth time he's mentioned. Uh, and then Moses breaks that pattern. Because it mentions Moses four times in Genesis 5. Or excuse me, Moses, Noah. Mentions Noah four times in Genesis 5. Then in Genesis 6, the fifth time Noah's mentioned, it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? And we know then that Noah is spared. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit later on. But then we know that Noah was spared from dying the way everybody else died. And that is in the flood. So in all of these things, not only count them, but enumerate them or look at the definition of them. Infirmities, reproaches. Infirmities are sicknesses, diseases, or we can have an infirmity of sin. Sin is a, an infirmity. And infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, 
distresses, and the word stress is in distress. So if you have ever had stress or distress, that's common to man. People have those. If you've ever had those, then you are, I, say, I won't say you're in luck, I will say you're blessed because God has a remedy for that. And God's remedy sometimes is not in removing the stress or the source of the distress. Sometimes God will leave it there. So let me deal with this subject for a little while today. There are those, and they're fed by the TV preachers, who have been told and they have been led to believe this thing, even though it never works. They have been told and they believe that if you say something forcefully enough with God, that God must then do what you tell him to do. They call it faith-filled words. They call it uh, word, faith, whatever, believe it, name it, claim it. There's lots of names for it. Some of them are meant to make it look good. Some of them are derogatory, but there's a lot of names for this. But it's the idea that says that if you ask God with enough faith, then God will absolutely give you everything you ask for. And, and they lay this thing on people that if you're poor or you don't have enough money, then it's your fault because you obviously haven't asked God with enough faith. You obviously didn't believe God could do this for you, which is why God didn't do it for you is because you didn't believe enough that God would do it for you. You and people like Joyce Myers and others will teach this idea that if you have if you say negative words, that cancels out the positive faith words that you said, which is another reason why you're not getting rich, like they're getting rich. I mean, it works for Joyce, right? It works for Joyce and it works for Creflo Dollar and all these other people who are named after money. It works for them and it works for them because... They've conned you into believing that if you send them a large amount of money, then you'll get a larger amount of money. And that never works. But they're rich. So it obviously it works for them because you never hear them say anything negative on their TV program. It's all positive. It's all good. And they tell you, and uh, one of them, Robert Tilton, he was like one of the worst of the worst. He was such a money grubber. And he claimed that he was taking this money and using it in all these foreign mission projects. And they investigated him. They found out it wasn't true. He was hoarding every bit of this to himself. But he, Robert Tilton always talked about you performing your vows. And your vows were, if you ask God for, you know, $10,000, then that was a vow that you made to God to give God $10,000 so you could get more out of him. And you had to pay your vows. And he read verses, just about every program, verses out of the Bible that talked about fulfilling your oath and fulfilling your vow, which meant writing him a check. And it works for them, but it doesn't work. For, and the sad thing is, these people convince people who are on government pensions, welfare, disability, or whatever, yeah, my mom's mom used to love to watch Jim. Be and I went to visit her one time when I was in college. And she said, have you seen this guy? And I, what I wanted to say was, yeah, he's an idiot. And she just watched Jim Baker all the time, sending money. Mamma, don't send these guys money. Because that was before Jim Baker's downfall. And we all know what he did with that. So... But it's the idea that they're convincing you that if you say negative words, and I'll give you an example. Man, I am sick today. That's a negative confession. You made yourself sick by proclaiming you were sick. 
I call it telling the truth. That's what I call it. Are you sick today? No, I'm healthy in Jesus' name. <coughs> they want, they, and they say to you, you cannot say those words. You cannot say that because that's a negative confession and it cancels out God, your faith words that would have healed you. And again, it lays the responsibility for you having any of these that Paul mentioned. Infirmities, reproaches, necessities. Necessities is having a bill that you're not sure you know how to pay. That's a necessity. Paul had them. Paul had necessities. Paul did not go around collecting enough money to advance his ministry. Paul refused to take the offerings that were given to him. He refused to take them. Paul rather chose to continue to wherever he went. He set up shop making tents for people, which is they lived in tents, and that's what he made for them. And he decided that he was going to work and pay his own way so that he was not beholden to anybody else, nor that anybody could accuse him of just being in it for the money. That's how he lived his life. Um, so, but Paul had necessities, Paul had distresses, Paul had, he was normal. He had all of these things and you never hear Paul or anybody else in the Bible for that matter saying negative words, cancel out faith filled words. Therefore, you're not going to get anything from God. And they always lay the responsibility on you. It's your fault that you can't pay your bills. It's your fault that you're not wealthy. It's your fault that you got sick and they, and I've had, I've had horror stories told me. One lady that followed our ministry, I believe now she's going on to be with the Lord, but she called me crying several times because she had um, some kind of lung disease. I don't remember what it was, or I don't know if she ever told me, but it was, she was dying and her lungs were no good. And she had her friends that were telling her, you obviously don't have enough faith for God to heal you. And she would call me crying. And I said, those are not your friends. If they tell you that, they're not your friends. What they're, what they're wanting you to do. See, they're wanting you to try this out for them. Because they're not sure they really believe it. So they want you to be the test subject. They want you to say enough faith-filled words to see if it works. And if it works for you, then they'll believe it. But they're laying on a guilt trip on you. And I, it, I would tell her, I said, this makes me mad. I never met the woman and it made me angry. I said, I'd like to sit down and have a talk with who your friends are and straighten this out. But I would read her scripture like this. I said, Paul asked God three times. Do you think that Paul didn't have enough faith? You're going to accuse Paul of not having faith? Is that what you're going to do? Because Paul asked God three times. Three times. And God would not remove the thorn that was in his flesh. A messenger of Satan to buffet him. He would not do it. And that's another issue. Paul was not possessed with a devil. He did not have a devil in him making him sick or causing him to act in an involuntary manner or anything else like that the way some of these people teach. Oh, you're sick, you have a devil. That devil needs to be cast out. Paul didn't have a devil possessing him. He had one beating on him. And there's a difference. It's a big difference. Paul had control over his own choices, his own decisions. Okay, devil possession is you don't have control anymore, they do. But they tell you you have a devil and you've got to cast that devil out. That devil needs to be cast out. You'll see people like Ernest Angley and others casting out devils of deafness or devils of back injuries and all of this stuff. And it's a, it's a show. It's a TV show. They caught uh, Peter Popoff. He would go around claiming that he was hearing from God about the diseases that were in the people that, in the audience. Come to find out, the people filled out a prayer request card before they walked in the building and wrote down exactly where they lived and what was wrong with them. And his wife was reading the cards to him 
and he had a little earpiece in his ear. He was listening to his wife backstage reading the names, the addresses, and the people and their diseases. And he would call their name out and say, you live so-and-so, and they're just all amazed. And he had this miracle knowledge from God. And he would go and lay hands on them and heal them. And they would fall down on the floor and everything else. And the people, they were just people that showed up. They weren't plants that were working for Popoff. But it's the power of suggestion that made them fall backward, slain in the spirit, so on, and believe that they were healed. And then testify, I feel a lot better. It's amazing how much better I feel. He didn't get healed. But that's how some of these charlatans work. So I want you to, I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul, perhaps the greatest Christian, the man with, I believe, the most faith, the man who evangelized more people than anybody else, single-handedly, started more churches, preached more sermons, did more as far as the work of the Lord, and he himself could not proclaim his own freedom from this thorn. What does that tell you? It tells you that somebody's lying, and I don't believe it's Paul. So, does God answer our prayers? Always. Yes. The answer is yes. And the answer is always. Now, in some cases, it's never immediate. Sometimes. Sometimes it is. By the way, Pam got her dog back. Yay! She prayed. I, I said, God, bring her dog back. Because she was so down. And she got her, her dog came back. That's God, amen. That's good. That's an answer. Now, God didn't bring it back immediately. We prayed Wednesday. Dog comes back Friday. Or something like that. But the dog came back. That's the important thing. Does God care about dogs? God cares about us. And God cares about dogs. God cares about sparrows. He cares about the least of his creation. And certainly God cares about us. The Reg Kelly preached a message one time, the stupidest, the stupidest statement in the Bible. And it was by the disciples who were in the ship when the storm came. Jesus was asleep uh, in the hull of the ship. And they went running down to him. Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he said, it's the stupidest question in the Bible. Of course, Jesus cares about whether you perish. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, of course, God cares about dogs and cats. My dad had a dog, Buster. And Buster got sick, and I was talking to my dad, and he said, will you pray for Buster? And so I said, God, I don't care anything at all about my dad's dog, but I care about my dad. So God, would you heal my dad's dog? And God did. And I said, thank you, God. God cares. The prayers that we pray, does God answer them? Yes. And he answers them all the time. Every single time. Does God answer them immediately? Not always. You know, you know as much about the Bible as I do concerning how God operates. God operates in time. And the Bible talks about when Jesus came the first time, it was at the exact right time that God wanted it to happen when Jesus comes the second time it is going to be at the exact time that God wants it to happen and it, it when it happens it will be the perfect time you have stories I have stories of how God answered prayers at the exact perfect time perfect timing but it wasn't always when we prayed it I'll give you an example Paul uh, says in, I, I think it's Romans, uh, Romans 9 maybe, 
that his prayer for Israel was that all Israel would be saved. Paul prayed that prayer 2,000 years ago. That prayer has not been fulfilled yet. But it's recorded for us, and guess what? God is going to answer that prayer, but it's going to be at the exact time that it needs to be. Not a minute before and not a minute late. So, when God answers your prayers is up to God, but trust Him that He does everything in perfect time. I'll give you another example. It did not rain before Noah got all the animals on the ark. God did not shut the door prematurely. God did not shut the door of the ark too late. He closed it at the exact right time. God did not destroy Sodom until after Lot and his daughters escaped. He didn't destroy it before. He did not wait until weeks after. He destroyed it just as Lot is far enough away to where he can see it happen and it didn't affect him. Uh, I think the Bible even says Abraham saw the smoke. I, d I don't remember that. But anyway, it was at the exact right time when God did it. Not too soon and not too late. So, when God answers our prayers, it is about His timing and not necessarily ours. You might want to write, you might want to be writing this stuff down. Okay? Number two, does God always give us everything we ask for? The answer is no. Sometimes God, and I'll, I'll throw this question in too, does God ever say no to us? I don't see that in scriptures. If you know of a scripture where God said no to, to one of his children, then I would stand corrected. But I'm not aware of a place where when someone prayed, God said no. When we asked for things from God, and I've even been told this too, that you have to get specific with God. You have to, you have to narrow it down and ask God very specifically exactly what you want God to do. I think God laughs at that. It's like, it would be like Roland, my grandson, who's saying to his mom he's hungry and then directing his mother on exactly what he wants and how he wants it prepared. Okay? Excuse me, mother, you're overcooking the peas. Yeah, I want the pe mom, I want the peas at exactly 235 degrees, okay? And I want exactly 18 of them, okay? That, that's the analogy. You telling the creator how to create. God didn't have us around before the creation. He does not need us to tell him exactly what it is that we need. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with you saying, God, this is what I want. But just know that God has a lot of surprises in his bag for us. Okay? A lot of surprises. A lot of things that God will do will actually be better than what we prayed. You know, the scripture says, for we know not what to ask or, or no, let me, let me get it right. For we know not what to pray. And the Holy Spirit will help our infirmities with words that cannot be uttered. If it says it cannot be uttered, it doesn't mean that we have to try to utter them. It means that the Holy Ghost can actually say our prayers better than we can say our prayers. Okay? which is why I'm not a fan of pre-written prayers, like in a church service, in some of the more orthodox 
uh, services, everything's a ritual. They have a, they have a prescribed prayer that is written out that the minister will speak or the congregation will speak. Now, everybody say this prayer, say these words. When Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, he did not say, say these words. He said, when you pray, pray after this manner. In other words, he gave an example, but he's not demanding that we stick to those exact words words our father which art in heaven but you're given an example number one in your prayer praise and exalt god and understand recognize that he is god alone and he's way up there and you're way down here number two give us this day give me what i need today what about tomorrow you pray it tomorrow pray the same thing you prayed today Pray it tomorrow, it worked today, it'll work tomorrow. Then he throws in forgiveness and repentance. That's necessary. If you're going to pray and ask God for things for yourself, why don't you be willing to give to others like forgiveness? Okay? But he didn't say pray these exact words. And so I am just don't like. Prayer should come from the heart. And the spirit, not from a piece of paper that somebody else wrote out for you. Because if we think that God automatically responds to the paper prayer, we're wrong. And they have some prayers that they call a prayer of invocation. And I'm not a big fan of that one either. Because it pretends to invoke God's presence or invoke God doing something when I don't think that we're the ones who get to command God to do what he's going to do when we want him to do it. So I'm not a big fan of what they call an invocation prayer. Now I may be overanalyzing that, but I just don't like it. I think if we're going to have a service and we want God to show up, let's ask God to do something for us. There's nothing wrong with asking. But to think that just because we read this prayer out loud that God automatically has to kick in gear now because it's 10 o'clock, God needs to show up now because we're all here. I, I just don't like that. I don't think we are in any position to demand God do anything. So just some things there about prayer. But the, the point I want to make on this one is ask. Ask for little things. Ask God for big things. Learn to do both. Ask God for everything. Learn to do it all. And then trust that God will do it. If you ask God to do something, then let God do it. Don't assume that, and some people will tell you, well, God's waiting for you to take the first step. Uh, if I knew how to take that step, I would have done it already. That's why I'm asking God. I don't know how to take the first step, where to take it, when to take it. So that's why I'm asking God, and I'm... Serious, if you ask God for something, let God handle it. There are times, you know, pastors deal with people. And sometimes people don't act the way they should in the church. And call me a chicken or call me whatever. But I think I have a track record of when I try to fix people's problems, it usually turns out worse than before I got involved. And I have learned that if I think somebody's not doing right 
or acting right. I think it's better for me to ask God to fix them or change my attitude about them. And that even works in mine and Lisa's relationship. We don't always agree. We don't always please one another. And I have learned that in the Bible says, dwell with them according to knowledge. And you got to know the Colliers and the Leonards. And I learned them. And I know my, my wife. And a lot of times it's best that I just ask God to work in her and do something in her and likewise her with me. And God does it. God does it better than I do it. And so you just learn to ask God for things and let God handle it. Let God deal with it. Let God do it. Let, let God let go and let God, they say, and I think that's right. But then, in this particular case with Paul, Paul asked God three times. Now, there's not a magic power in the number three here, whereby if you ask three times in a row, then, then that invokes God, and of course, he'll do it. Um, you know, why Paul asked God three times, I have several ideas. They may be right, they may be wrong. But we just know that he asked God three times. And some, some, there might even be some that say, well, he should have asked four. No, he asked God three times. One time is enough. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The prayer, that's singular. That's one prayer. How many times did Elijah plead with God to bring the fire down on the altar and the sacrifice. How many times did the prophets of Baal do it? All day long. They made a big show. They cut themselves. They screamed. They, did, they put on a big thing to try to... And Elijah, I love it. Elijah was making fun of them. Is your God asleep? What's, you know, we're kind of running out of time here, guys. And Elijah prayed one time, and God sent fire down. The Bible says that Elijah was a man of like passions as we. He prayed one time that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. So I really do believe that one prayer out of one person is all it takes. Now, I'm going to throw this one in too. I don't believe that everything that God does for us is a product of prayer. How many things has, how many ways has God blessed you that you never even asked for? I mean, we, we say to say a prayer over our meal before we eat it, and that's right and proper and true, but we didn't actually pray to get the meal. God gave it to us. And so, God loves his creation, and he loves man, and he loves lost people, and he loves saved people alike. And God will give us way more than we can ever ask for. That's the kind of God he is. But what Paul got from God here was not what he asked for. So God didn't say no. God gave him something better. So, here's what I'm going to say to you. Whatever your infirmity is and whatever your thorn is, even in some cases where you ask God to take a particular sin out of your life, if you ask God to do it, then God will either do it or he will give you grace. So, which is better? 
God always knows what's best for us and what's better. And if He offers you grace instead of removing the thorn, then God obviously thinks that that's better for you in the long run. In the whole scope of life, that's better for you. So trust God. Trust Him for everything. And then just watch and see how good God has been to you. So I'll just ask one question and then we'll dismiss. Who in here has asked God to forgive them of their sins repeatedly and God has in fact forgiven them every single time for everything they've done? And I would, I would ask you to show me in the scriptures where God won't forgive you if you are a true son of God. Yes, God does actually care whether or not you perish. God's either going to deal with you as a son and drive that sin out of you, or he's going to give you grace. One way or the other, it's God's call. Okay? Now, if you start thinking, well, then can I sin all I want to? Try it. Let me t t t try it, and we'll see how it works for you. Because if you can handle the punishment, be my guest. Father, you are indeed better to us, Father, than we could have ever asked. Lord, I have things that I'm blessed with in my life that I never even thought to ask you for and you gave me father the blessings that you have poured down on me I say to you and in front of all these witnesses I didn't deserve one of them but you've been better to me father than I've ever asked you to be you have done for me things that I had no idea that you would do. And you have always forgiven me. Always. So Father, I stand before you and with these witnesses and say, God, you have truly, your grace truly is sufficient. Even, Lord, if I have infirmities and distresses and necessities, having grace in my life is far better than taking all of these away from me. So, Father, I stand here, but by grace alone. The Father teaches grace, teaches just how good you are to your people. How good you are to even people that don't even believe in you. You're good to them as well. Father, bless your word today. Thank you, God, for having mercy on us all. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen.